We skipped verses 5 through 8 last week to wait until we got to chapter 2 because they all tie in with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, if you look at Acts chapter 1, in verses 9 through 11 is when Jesus ascends into heaven. And you have in verses uh, uh, 4 through 8, Jesus' promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there should be some handouts that are making their way around to you uh, so that you can follow along with this. Give the guys some time and they'll, uh, they will get one to you. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4, the Bible says, "...in being assembled," this is talking about uh, the apostles, the twelve apostles, or at this point the eleven before Matthias was, uh, was added to them, "...and being assembled together with them." You all with me in Acts 1 and verse 4? "...being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit." When Jesus makes the promise of the Holy Spirit, one important thing for us to see... Buzz, I've lost control of this thing somehow. I'm not sure how. One important thing for us to see when we look at the coming of the Holy Spirit, the promise of this coming, is that Jesus made this promise to the apostles. I want you to underscore that in your mind. When Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit upon individuals, that promise was made in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you read about it. And here at the beginning of Acts, when you read about it, that promise is made to the apostles. Those are the individuals uh, that he's addressing. Look in, just in the context. Look at the end of verse 2. Uh, if, if you want to see the context, Acts 1 and verse 2, he had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, whom he had presented himself. And so he's gathered together with them in verse 4. And he makes reference in verse 4, wait in Jerusalem for what? For the promise of the Father. And you may have a translation that capitalizes the word promise. Uh, translators felt that that word uh, needed to be capitalized for some reason. But this was a significant event for, the, for Jesus to say, you wait there for the promise of the Father to reach you. That promise, Jesus ties in with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so when you look back in Luke chapter 24, and we, we said last week, look in Luke 24, hold your finger in Acts chapter 1. In Luke 24, you have the end of, of uh, Luke's former treatise, what he calls his former treatise in Acts 1. So Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1 dovetail together, they overlap uh, in that the events, the things that happen at the end of Luke 24 are the events, the things that happen at the beginning of Acts chapter 1. And uh, there is some overlap, dovetailing together. Uh, but look in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, where Jesus says, Behold, I send what? I send the promise of my Father upon you. What's this promise? And what we're going to see in the book of Acts is that this promise that Jesus promised to, uh, uh, to send upon them, the promise that he tells the apostles, wait in Jerusalem to receive this, is the promise that he made uh, back in Joel chapter 2. Jesus ties the promise of the Father in with the coming of the Holy Spirit. He told the apostles, wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, go back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, the end of verse 4. Don't depart from Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said which he said, you have heard from, from me. How often did Jesus talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit? I wish we had time to go back and look at John chapter 14, chapters 14, 15, and 16. If you want one of the, uh, the greatest treatises, the, the greatest treatments, uh, one of the, the most uh, uh, expansive treatments uh, of the Holy Spirit from the word from the lips of Jesus. It's there in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. Those three chapters, if you'll go and look at them in your Bible, uh, almost the entirety of those chapters are, if you have a Bible that has red letters, almost the entirety of those chapters are in red letters. Then you get to John chapter 17, and everything, except for the first few words of verse 1, in that chapter are in red letters. John chapter 17 
is, uh, is the actual Lord's Prayer. I know we call another passage the Lord's Prayer, but here you have an entire chapter that is the Lord's Prayer. Now, what is significant about the timing of Acts uh, or of John in those chapters? What's significant about that timing in the life of Jesus? Where does Jesus go in the very next chapter, John chapter 18? What starts to transpire in John chapter 18? It's okay for y'all to talk. Say again. He, he, he is going to the, the place where he's going to, he's going to Gethsemane, where he's going to pray, and where he's going to be arrested. You start in John chapter 13. 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. This is the most uh, detailed uh, version uh, of what transpires in that upper room. But what I wanted to point out is that in chapters 14, 15 and 16, Jesus promises them that he is going to send the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts 1 and verse 4, you might note that when he says, this is a promise, the promise of the Father, which you have heard from me. He spent three chapters, what we have in our Bible, three chapters, promising that he would send the Holy Spirit. And he talks about it in John 14, he talks about it in chapter 15, talks about it in chapter 16, and all of these passages are in your notes. And I would encourage you to go back and, and to look at those uh, passages and, and tie them in with what Jesus is saying here at the end of John chapter 1 and verse 4. He says, these are promises that you have heard from me. Now, when he promises to send the Holy Spirit, Jesus told them how the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them. Now, there are individuals today who have the idea, who have created the idea, because it's not a biblical idea, and we'll spend some time talking about that if we, if we can get there. There are some individuals today who would claim that the Holy Spirit speaks to them. Some people today who would claim that the Holy Spirit led them to do something, separate and apart from the Word of God, but that the Holy Spirit nudged them, spoke to them, uh, whispered in their ear kind of thing. When Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit, who did he promise it to? The apostles. That's who he made that promise to. When he promised the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus detailed the manner in which the Holy Spirit was going to come. Was the Holy Spirit going to come in a secretive, quiet, whisper it, you might not know it, and people around you might not be aware of it, manner? Is that how the Holy Spirit was going to come? First of all, Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, that you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Think about that imagery. What does Jesus compare the baptism of the Holy Spirit with? In, in Acts 1 and verse 5. Before he says you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, what does he compare it with? Baptism of John. John indeed baptized you with water. What is, what is the word baptize, the English word baptize? I know it has varied meanings in the English language, but what does the original Greek language, what does that word mean? It is an immersion. When somebody is immersed in water, another word that's used by the lexicographers is that they have been submerged, that they have been overwhelmed by the water. Jesus says, you, you see the word you in Acts 1 and verse 5? John indeed baptized with water, but you, who's he talking to? Underscore these words you. We had, it on, we had it earlier on your page. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does the word baptized mean with the Holy Spirit? Does it mean some, some uh, mystical kind of uh, uh, little nudge here, little nudge there, or whisper in the ear? What does the word baptized mean? Apostles, you're going to be submerged. You're going to be overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. Is this something you might notice if it happened to you? Holy Spirit, overwhelming. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Would it, would it be something that you would recognize as happening to you? The, the word literally means that they would be overwhelmed. 
by the measure, by the influence of the Spirit that would come upon them, uh, just as if they were uh, the idea of being immersed uh, in water, they were being immersed by the Spirit. But notice also in verse 8 that Jesus detailed the purpose. Why? And, and we, we, could, we could go to other passages to talk about the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming. But I want us to limit it to what we're studying here in Acts chapter 1. Why did Jesus say that the Holy Spirit was going to come? In verse 8, again, who is he talking to in verse 8? Talking to the apostles. And he says, but you, apostles, shall receive power. There's another idea of the manner of his coming. Was it going to be secretive? Was it going to be kind of... Uh, here, maybe a little there. It, he's going to come and the word that Jesus chose to use for that power, he's going to come like dynamite, dunamis, power. He, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you are going to receive that power for what purpose? Verse 8, you're going to receive that power for what purpose? So that you can be witnesses to me. The manner of the coming is that they're going to be overwhelmed by this spirit. They're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Hold your finger again in, in Acts 1. Go back to Luke chapter 24 again. Just, just to, you, you might overlap these passages in your mind. Luke 24 and verse 49, we saw this where Jesus said, told them to uh, tarry. Uh, behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem... Until what, until what happens? Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until... What word do you have after until? In your Bible. Luke 24, 49. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you. Who's he talking to? The apostles. Keep, keep that, that. That is so critically important. Until you are endued with what? Power. Where's that power going to come from? FPL? Where's the power going to come from? The, the solar energy? The windmills? Where's the power going to... It's going to come from on high. This isn't some man-made power. This is God-made power. He says, you stay there until you are endued. What's another word for endued? Until you receive... Isn't, doesn't that sound like Acts 1 and verse 8? You will receive power. You will be endued with power. Now, tied Luke 24, 49 with Acts 1 and verse, 20, and Acts 1 and verse 8. Luke 24, 49 says, stay in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. Where's power going to come from? On high. When are they going to receive power? Acts 1 and verse 8. At what moment will they receive power? Acts 1 and verse 8. When, when what? The Holy Spirit comes upon them. The power from on high will be the power, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the, the measure, the influence, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes upon the apostles while they are in the city of Jerusalem. For what purpose? So that these men could become witnesses to Christ. I didn't put this anywhere on your sheet just because I didn't have room. But I think we need to understand the way that the Bible uses the word witness. And to consider the way that the religious world uses the word witness today. You hear people talking about uh, going and witnessing to other people. The word witness has a definition, doesn't it? A witness. What, what's the definition of a, of a witness? You go to the, the, the court of law today. What's the definition of a witness? A person that saw it. Can you put a person on the stand who heard the story about it? What's the objection going to be? But hearsay, you know, he doesn't have a clue. He didn't see it. He's only heard about it. Your witness has got to see it. So when the apostles went out, they went out as witnesses. What made them to be qualified to be witnesses? Well, as the apostles, they had been immersed in the Holy Spirit. They had an extra power. But what qualified them to be witnesses? They had to have seen something. Is it possible that we can go out and witness today? Using that word in a, in a verb form, go and witness to other people? I know what they mean by it. And perhaps we could just 
uh, count it uh, as just a uh, as just another word for evangelize or another word for teach. But words have meanings. The meaning of that word is I've seen something and I need to tell you about it. Um, well, it, the reality is none of us saw Jesus hanging on that cross. None of us saw the empty tomb and none of us saw the, the wounds in his hands. We are not eyewitnesses of those things. Does that mean I can't go out and tell other people about it? Yeah, I can tell them about it. I'm just not a witness of it. Now, that's, that's a side note. It's not anywhere in your notes. Come back. What was the purpose of them receiving the Holy Spirit? Purpose of them receiving the Holy Spirit was not so that they could go and do tricks. Purpose of them receiving the Holy Spirit was not so that they could, uh, they could come to a new town, set up a circus tent, and charge admission to see the, all the tricks and, uh, and things that they would perform by the power that the Holy Spirit gave them. The purpose of the Holy Spirit coming upon them was so that they could go and teach the gospel. Now, tie back in those verses from the Gospel of John, where Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth has come... He will guide you into all. You know that verse? He's going, to invite, he, he's, going to, he's going to bring, John 14, he says, He's going to bring to your remembrance all things that I've taught you. John 14, verse 26. Chapter 16, verse 23 says, When the Spirit of truth has come, He's going to guide you into all truth. That was the per Now, who was Jesus talking to in those verses? He's not talking. To us to say the Holy Spirit's going to come upon us. He's saying it to the, and, and I know you're saying, why does he keep repeating that? Because it's critically important for us to know who these promises were being made to. Now, that was Acts chapter 1. Go to chapter 2. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is promising the coming of the Holy Spirit. When you get to Acts chapter 2, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes. Does he come sort of like Jesus promised that he would come? He comes just as Jesus promised that he would come. Now, in Acts chapter 2, where are the apostles? What city are they in? Jerusalem. Where did Jesus tell them to stay? Jerusalem. So we, we, you start to, when you get to Acts 2, you start to see things fall into place. Before Acts 2, Jesus told the apostles, you stay in Jerusalem. You get to Acts 2, where are they? They're in Jerusalem, just like Jesus had told them to be. You get to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come. What was the day of Pentecost? What was that? It's the day of Pentecost. Y'all are not, they're more talkative in there than you are out here. Day of Pentecost. Okay, day of Pentecost. What, there, there were three annual feast days which the Lord commanded all male Jews to go to the city of Jerusalem. This is one of those occasions. Now, what, what can get confusing, and this is the reason I put it on your sheet for you, what can get confusing sometimes is when you read in the Old Testament, this is called by different names. Uh, and so sometimes you think, boy, this is, there are 40 different feasts. Well, it's, it's talking about the same time period, just from a different vantage point, perhaps in a different context. And so the, the word Pentecost is a Greek word. And so this was a word that the Greeks had started to use to identify this period of time on the Jewish calendar. The Jews had not used the, the day Pentecost. It was something that the Greeks had uh, used to talk about it. But when you go back to the Old Testament, it was a feast day that was called the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks, why would it be called that? It's called that because from Passover to Pentecost, what was in between? Weeks, seven weeks to be specific. So they, they called that period of time uh, the Feast of Weeks. We, I wish we had time to talk about this. They called it the Feast of Harvest because this is when the first harvest came in. They called it the Feast of Ingathering sometimes because what do you do when you bring in the harvest? You gather it in. So they made a word, ingathering. Uh, so they had the Feast of Ingathering where you're bringing in that first harvest. And then sometimes they referred to it as the first fruits or the Feast of First Fruits because when they celebrated the harvest, when they celebrated the ingathering, 
What portion of the harvest in the end gathering, what portion of that did they give to the Lord? The first part of it, the first fruit. So all of that is wrapped up in this idea of Pentecost. Acts 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, 50 days after the day of Pentecost and uh, after the day of Passover, 50 days after the day of Passover, you have Pentecost. If Passover is on a Saturday and you count 50 days after that, it's not hard to figure out, is it? Because you go seven, if you go seven weeks from one Saturday, what do you get? What day of the week do you land on? Saturday. Saturday. We got that figured out. So if I add one more day, what day do I land on? Every Pentecost was a Sunday. Is that just coincidence? Is it just coincidence that when we get to Acts chapter 2, that it, it just happens to be the day of Pentecost? I mean, would, would it have mattered if it was Thursday? I mean, would it, would it really make a big... Would, would it matter if it was Tuesday? Does, does it really matter? Or is there significance to the fact that it was the first day of the week? What day of the week did Jesus come out of the grave? First day of the week. Now you get to Pentecost, and if it did not matter that this was... If it didn't matter that this was the first day of the week, then why does the Bible tell us that that's what day it was? Why, why waste the time to tell us what, does the Bible always tell us what day of the week things happened? No. So why tell us this one? If it doesn't matter. When the day of Pentecost, the Bible says, had fully come. That, that, that phraseology there is interesting. There's a, in the American standard, there's a footnote. It says, when that day was being fulfilled. When you read that statement, guess what? We're, we're not going to finish this tonight, so I'm going to stop trying. Um, when you read that statement, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. What does it mean when a day has fully come? Day is fully come. Why, why, why phrase it that way? I mean, why didn't you just say, and on Pentecost, this is what happened? Why, why phrase it that way? The day of Pentecost had, was being fulfilled. So, it's just, it's just another day. And it's another Pentecost. Guess when they're going to have another Pentecost? When's the next Pentecost going to be? Next year. Will they have another Pentecost after that? Well, yeah, just wait two more years. you have another one. What's the big deal? This was the day that God had been waiting for. This was the day that God had been working down through history to finally arrive on this day. Why do we say that? You go back and you read the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, you read passages that say, in the last days, we'll see Joel 2.28 says it, Isaiah 2 and verse 2 says it, that there's something that's going to happen in the last days. God had been talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. What is verse 16? This is jumping ahead a little bit. But what does Peter say in Acts 2 and verse 16? What does Peter say in Acts 2 and verse 16? This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Everything that's happening here, this is it. Underline the word this in your Bible. Peter gets up and, and, and there's, there's likely some excitement in his voice that says, this is it. We, that, that, it's not that we have been preparing for this day. The Lord has been preparing for this day from the very beginning. What happens in Acts chapter 2? The church is established in Acts chapter 2. The church comes into existence on this day. When did the Lord first have the idea to create a church? When, when, when did that, that little, maybe in God's mind there's no little idea, right? When did that idea first 
across the mind of the divine to, to create a church. When did that happen? Was, was it a Monday? Was it a Tuesday? When, when did he first have that idea? He had that idea before there were any days. Ephesians 3 and verses 10 and 11 say that the church was in the eternal purpose of God. When, when, did God, when did God have the idea to create the church? We don't know, but we know it was before, let there be light. That's when we know it was. Let there be light. What day was that? Not a hard question. When God said, let there be light, what day was that? First one. When did God have the idea for the church? Before that one. Before there were any days. And so when you read Acts 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled, when you read Peter saying, this is it. This is the day that before God ever created the world, he was waiting to arrive. I want, you to, I want you to think about the significance of this day. And oh, by the way, what day of the week was it? It's a Sunday. Does that matter to God? It, do you think God could choose the day that his son would be raised from the dead? Think he could have chosen that day out of any of them? You think God could have chosen the day that the church would be established, that his kingdom would come into existence? Could he have chosen any day he wanted? Is there any significance to God doing that? What I'd like to ask you to do, because uh, we're almost out of time tonight, is I want you to take Acts chapter 2. Next week we're going to have a prayer meeting. I want you to take Acts chapter 2, and I want you to devour Acts chapter 2 over these next couple weeks. Because what happens at the beginning of this chapter is what Jesus had been promising. The apostles are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you again, was this some secretive thing that nobody knew about? How did the Holy Spirit come upon them? Acts chapter 2, how did the Holy Spirit come upon them? As the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Was it a rushing mighty wind? No, it doesn't say it was a rushing mighty wind, but it says it was the sound like of a rushing mighty wind. Can you hide that? Can you hide the sound of a rushing mighty wind? Can you hide that? And while the apostles, the 12 of them are gathered in that room, what is there that appears on each of them? Some type of, we call it a cloven or a forked uh, tongue of fire, whatever that means. Can, if you've got fire on your head, can you hide that? Let me ask you this. If your head was on fire, could you hide that? If your head was on fire, could you, now if the fire is on your head, could you hide that? I don't know how big that fire was. But could you hide, what, what if you just put a cap on? Could you hide it under a bushel? No, you can't hide that. You, you've, got a, you've got a fire. And then what started happening? What did they start doing? Speaking in tongues. How did people, this is, this is a uh, first grade question, y'all. How did the people know that they were speaking in tongues? It's not hard, is it? When somebody speaks... What is that commercial? I don't can't even think of it right now. When E.F. Hutton speaks. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so they were speaking in other languages. And what happens in verse 6? We'll come back and start right here in two weeks. In verse 6, the multitude gathers together. Why in verse 6 were they gathering together? What happens? What does verse 6 say? Why are they gathering? Why is the multitude gathering together? Because they heard this. They heard what was going on and they've got to figure out. Now, the apostles started together in a place with themselves, but all of a sudden they get a crowd around them. And the reason is 
Not because the Holy Spirit came and whispered in their ear a little secret, but because the Holy Spirit came, immersed them with power to the point that they began to speak languages they had never studied and to speak words they had never said in their life. When Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, He gave details about it. The Holy Spirit came just as He was promised. And this is an event, in case you're not here in two weeks, this is an event that is only going to happen one more time in the history of the earth. And that's in Acts 10. And it would never happen again. Thank you so much for your good attention tonight. Read Acts chapter 2. We'll jump back in it next week.